Hi, thanks so much for being here. My name is Dr. Daniel Spratt. I'm the chairman and professor of radiation oncology at University Hospital Seidman Cancer Center in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a real pleasure to speak with you all today about some of the latest in biomarkers uh, in prostate cancer. These are my disclosures. I work with a variety of companies trying to advance the personalized treatment for prostate cancer. So question number one is really, where do we stand today with personalized treatment for men with newly diagnosed or localized prostate cancer? And so, you know, I would say, unfortunately, most people around the world, most clinicians, and then, you know, most patients, what we still rely on is about a 60-year-old grading system. It's called the Gleason system. And it has been modified over the decades, but this system was never meant to what we call prognosticate or risk stratify to tell men who have aggressive or non-aggressive disease. It was designed to, as pattern recognition to see distinct patterns of prostate cancer. We also use PSA. There's a lot of limitations of PSA. And you know what we call T stage or tumor stage um, is most commonly measured by the rectal exam. There's a lot of um, limitations to that. And more recently in the past decade or so using prostate MRI, which is very good at some things, but it's only about 60% sensitive, meaning it actually detects all the patients who have what we call T3 disease, cancer that is extended outside of the prostate capsule. And very importantly, none of these tools that we use clinically every day were actually developed with the intention to optimally prognosticate or risk stratify or tell us how best to treat the patient. We've actually looked at this in numerous um, randomized trials that we pulled together and these patients were treated with you know, very uh, standardized treatments with long-term follow-up over 10,000 men. And one of the metrics you can use, it's a statistical test called a C-index, it's a measure of discrimination. And you could think a coin flip would give you a C index of 0.5, meaning it's random chance that you would accurately tell a patient, hey, you're gonna have a recurrence of your disease. Well, a lot of these clinical tools we use, the Gleason score or PSA or that T stage, or even NCCN risk groups, which are like D'Amico risk groups, you can see are barely better than a coin flip at actually telling men, are you going to develop recurrence from your disease or not? And it's not surprising because once again, these tools were never created to optimally risk stratify. They just happen to be mildly prognostic. And a very important uh, quote that I use often is that you can't learn anything new until you're open enough to forget everything you think you know. And so, you know, cancer at its core is a genetic disease. And I don't mean that it's passed down, you know, through your family or it's hereditary, but it's a genetic um, process that happens within um, what was once normal tissue and it became cancerous tissue. And you know, the central, we call dogma from DNA to RNA to protein, which is really quantitative, we measure the downstream effect of this in the prostate with the Gleason grade histology, these patterns, or maybe by radiology, what is the patterns you see? Some people use the PIRAD system, but this is phenotypic, right? This is just sort of the phenotype that gets created that the, we have, we call it human interpretability that we interpret and it's error prone and highly subjective. There's a lot of disagreement amongst expert radiologists and pathologists when they're looking at the same image. But we also have genotype or really objective measures, right? Where this is quantitative. You take that tumor out, you genomically analyze it. You should get with very reproducible uh, you get very reproducible results to the same uh, genomic result. And so this is a study um, that, that we did in almost 20,000 men with high-risk prostate cancer that underwent surgery and, and taking their, a piece of their tumor and running it through gene expression analysis, 
This is looking at about 15 to 20 gene expression signatures. So each row here um, is looking um, at a different gene expression signature and each you could call it column here is one of these, you know, almost 20,000 patients. And the different colors is those with kind of more aggressive, um, you know, scores of each of these or more indolent or less aggressive scores. And what really I'm trying to show is there's a lot of heterogeneity here, right? Even though this is called high risk prostate cancer, some men clearly have biologically more aggressive disease, some have more indolent disease. And there's been, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of various gene expression or genomic tests created. And a lot of them, frankly, are just not very good or have not undergone rigorous testing. But, you know, I always say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because yes, while some of these are not ready for prime time or probably will never be used, there are some that have now very robust validation that have been used in clinical trials. And that's what I want to show you today. So the three main genomic tests or biomarkers that are used in the United States predominantly are the three listed here. They're, they all have variable amounts of coverage through CMS, um, so Medicare, and they have different indications where they can be considered for use. You know, one of them is called the Oncotype test. And it's, um, as you see here, it's, there's multiple retrospective studies. There actually is one prospective, you could call it a trial or a cohort. It's called the Canary Pass, you know, cohort. Uh, men on active surveillance. And, you know, it didn't quite reach statistical significance, um, but, you know, it maybe could help identify which men would have adverse pathology um, and whether that's a meaningful endpoint, meaning is the, is the Gleason score actually going up or higher? That's a, that's a debatable, uh, you know, um, question, but that's really what the evidence is. For Prolaris, it's a test, just to be clear, that uses something called CAPRA. That's a, like NCCN. It uses your Gleason score, your PSA, your age. It's a clinical model, free for all men, and it combines it with a gene expression test that's called the cell cycle progression score, CCP. And they combine it into this you know, product you'd order. But you know, I would say, unfortunately, at least in localized prostate cancer, and this is in a large cohort of men getting radiation, that C index, if you remember what I told you before, was only for the gene expression part of it, 0 0.52, which is basically a coin flip. So I would say that, you know, really a lot more work needs to be done to show that this is going to add benefit to these patients. And the last one is Decipher, and it's been tested now in numerous randomized trials. Um, and seems to be consistently able to improve prognostication for a lot of endpoints, biochemical recurrence, something called metastasis, free survival, and overall survival. And to sort of highlight some of that data, this is now already outdated because there's so much work being done. This is 42 different studies that tested the use of that Decipher genomic test in about 30,000 men. And you can see uh, in both what we call retrospective kind of cohort studies from centers, as well as in prospective registries and trials, a lot of work has been done both in men where the tissue that's sent for the test is the man's you know, biopsy when they're diagnosed, the biopsy tissue. And some of it's men who've had surgery and they want to get the test. Um, and it's that tissue that's sent from the prostatectomy sample. And, you know, things that have been looked at is, you know, um, does it improve the ability to discriminate or risk stratify metastatic disease, recurrence, death from prostate cancer? Does it change management? And, you know, the summary is across pretty much all of the studies, it improves those endpoints. And so because of that, you know, we've developed rather than the NCCN risk groups, we created something called the clinical genomic risk groups where you combine NCCN, which is what our national guidelines in the US are based upon how we treat patients. And you combine it with that decipher risk group that it provides on the test report to create 
a new risk grouping system. And what's fascinating and what's really transformative is that you go from that coin flip and you add your clinical variables and it improves, right? I said they're mildly or moderately improve your ability to risk stratify. And the clinical genomic model, you're about you know 85% accurate. You're not 100%, but you're much better than we ever were before. And when you do this, what this is showing you, and it's, it's, it's a busy um, you know, figure, but I'll walk you through it, is that on the x-axis here, this would be, this is a thousand men on a prospective cohort that had very low risk disease by NCCN to very high risk disease. And the different colors within each of these and percentages is how they'd be reclassified using this new clinical genomic system. And for example here, is overall about two out of three patients would be reclassified from their NCCN risk group to the clinical genomic risk group. So it's gonna change recommendations a lot. A great example is men with what's called favorable intermediate risk disease, like a Gleason score of three plus four equals seven. Almost half of these men actually have biologically low risk disease or more indolent disease. Now there's increasing number of studies that now are showing how this is you know, cl clinically relevant. So it's not just a bunch of statistics, how can this be used? A great study out of UCSF in California looked at men undergoing active surveillance and they tried to see what were the strongest predictors of men being reclassified on their subsequent biopsies on active surveillance, right? Active surveillance is for men with lower risk disease. You often get a biopsy and PSA um, frequently. You might get a biopsy every year. And what they showed was that the strongest predictor of a patient, you know, at their next biopsy or even, you know, biopsies over the first three years of it becoming a higher grade tumor and often coming off of surveillance was genomics, the genomic score. It, and it was not MRI, interestingly enough. And a, a comparable study done uh, at University of Michigan that I was part of um, looked at men under active surveillance. And they showed that men with that high decipher score very rapidly came off of active surveillance. Okay, And so it begs the question, should you be putting these men on active surveillance? Or if you do, you probably want to be monitoring them more closely. There's a lot of other studies, and I'll highlight a few of them, that are actually randomized prospective trials that they went back and obtained the tissue from these trials, and they ran this, this genomic test. And so the first one, I'll be presenting this in the middle of February at GU ASCO, uh, so this is, you know, for you, you to see here, potentially first, it's a randomized trial of different doses of radiation for men with intermediate risk prostate cancer. And the decipher test was independently prognostic for all of these different endpoints. This is recurrence, PSA recurrence, men needing more therapy, developing metastasis, dying of prostate cancer, even just how long they live. So, you know, very robust. And similarly, this was presented this past year at a national meeting by Paul Nguyen from Dana-Farber in three different randomized trials of men with high-risk prostate cancer. And again, for these endpoints, it was prognostic, okay? It added, uh, it was independently prognostic for metastasis, death from prostate cancer, and how long the men lived. And I always like to refer to these figures here. If you look at men with Gleason score eight to 10, we call that high grade prostate cancer. Look at the heterogeneity of these genomic scores amongst men who have high grade disease. And it's fascinating. Some have very low genomic scores, some have very high. And that's that clinical heterogeneity, um, uh, at the value of risk stratification that clearly the Gleason score is not good enough. Probably one of the most practice changing papers uh, I was a part of led by Felix Fang and, and Fu Tran was actually a trial of men getting post-operative or called salvage radiation therapy after they've had surgery and had a recurrence. 
it was a randomized trial of adding two years of an antiandrogen hormone therapy called bicalutamide. But what's interesting is running the decipher test on that, those with low scores, low genomic scores, almost no man on that trial um, died of prostate cancer. And actually, if you look here at the benefit in the men who got two years of hormone therapy, those with lower genomic scores, there was no improvement essentially in metastatic disease, death from prostate cancer, and it appeared that more of these men actually died um, who got the hormone therapy. And you know that may be just due to the side effects of long-term hormone therapy when these men don't benefit from it. And around you know, um, the same time, very recently came out, was a trial from Europe where they went back and actually analyzed that genomic test as well. And this is all in men that just got, you know, post-operative radiation therapy. There was no hormone therapy. And again, those with the high decipher scores, I mean, look at that, by five years, over half of the men had recurred. So clearly in these patients, radiation alone is just not sufficient. All this work that I've been fortunate to be a part of and lead has now, uh, developed into two very large randomized phase three trials that are run uh, in North America. Um, their, their names are, uh, one's the guidance trial and one is the predict RT trial. The one on the guidance trial, this is an intermediate risk disease, specifically what's called unfavorable intermediate risk disease. And using that genomic test, the decipher score, we're trying to determine, do these men really need hormone therapy or can they get radiation alone? Or for those with more aggressive disease uh, by the genomic score, should we add a novel antiandrogen called darolutamide to improve their outcomes? And similarly, in men with high-risk disease, where we often give men radiation in two years of hormones, can we use the genomic test to de-escalate, shorten their hormone therapy, or once again, if a high score intensify with newer therapies. Now, I, I know I, when I show this, sometimes pathologists or radiologists don't like this slide. And, you know, fortunately, things are changing because we're now in an era where it's not just about what's human interpretable, meaning that you can digitize these pathology slides. And you know the images now from MRI are already digitized, but you can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to extract features from these images that are not readily interpretable by humans, right? And those features may have a lot of information that we just can't appreciate. And I'll give you an example here of work I'll be presenting in a couple of weeks um, that maybe this really is a quantitative method that will be similar to these more genomic-based tests. And so what we've done is, you know, with a large group of collaborators with NRG Oncology and a company called Artera is um, digitized the slides from five large randomized trials with, you know, about 5,600 men, okay? And it's about 16 terabytes of imagery, right, of digitizing those slides. And what you see, the AI model, the artificial intelligence model we call ARPCAP, you can see that that C index here, it's, it's a similar called AUC, but its ability is far superior to predict which men will develop distant metastatic disease at five years and 10 years than our standard NCCN risk groups. And it's very consistent. These are three different trials in different risk group patients. This is in high risk. This is kind of across the spectrum. And this is more in intermediate risk. You can see there's just massive improvement in the ability to discriminate or risk stratify patients using just their pathology images and this model that's been created. And so everything I've shown you so far is about risk stratification. It's trying to say, well, normally you have a group of men with what we'll call intermediate risk prostate cancer or high risk prostate cancer, but we don't have the tools within those groups to say who has indolent or aggressive disease. And these prognostic tests really help us to improve and identify and risk stratify these patients. 
But one of the holy grails people always want to accomplish is predictive biomarkers, meaning is there some unique feature about this man's cancer that we may add hormone therapy or use radiation or not give one of those therapies because they won't biologically benefit from it. Unfortunately, prostate cancer is, has, is very quiet, meaning this is the mutational landscape of prostate cancer, especially localized prostate cancer. And all the gray area here means that these patients have zero mutations in these common um, cancer associated genes. Okay, some involved in DNA repair and other common uh, kind of hallmark pathways in cancer. And so it's just very quiet. And some of these are not targetable today, like P53. We don't have a drug that specifically today targets, um, you know, to help these patients. So as a radiation oncologist, you know, there unfortunately is no predictive biomarkers that will actually guide the use of radiation therapy. I'll show you some that have attempted to, but I would say they're not ready for prime time. And then I'll actually show you some hot off the press data about we finally probably have our very first predictive biomarker to guide the use of hormone therapy. But as of today, right now, there are no clinically used tools that can help us with this. So regarding predicting, do you need radiation or what dose? There is something called the radiosensitivity index. It's another gene expression test. Unfortunately, it has very little work in prostate cancer and the limited data in prostate cancer was not significant, meaning it's unclear that this really is going to be significant to identify which men need radiation. And also unfortunately, in some of the most recent data published in breast cancer, it didn't seem to actually tell you which men need, sorry, in this case, it's women, my apologies, um, benefit um, from radiation for breast cancer. So I would say the jury is definitely still out on this. Um, I was part of, of a collaboration with Dr. George Zhao and Felix Fang who um, developed this PORTO score for do, you, do men benefit from radiation after surgery? And there was this paper showed that potentially this gene expression test may, but what I would say is what's unclear is that does this actually predict radio sensitivity, meaning do the men benefit from radiation because their tumors are more sensitive or resistant, or is it simply saying it's a measure of men who already have metastatic disease or micrometastatic disease. Because if you already have metastatic disease, of course, radiating the pelvis is not going to help them. So again, more data is needed. But some of the most exciting data that I'm um, very fortunate to, to lead with multiple collaborators is going to be presented soon of the very first predictive biomarker to help identify which men need or don't need hormone therapy. We trained this artificial intelligence model on four large randomized trials and we validated it in a separate randomized trial where half the men got radiation and half the men got hormone therapy with radiation. And what you're seeing here is that using this artificial intelligence biomarker based upon the, the pathology slides from the men's biopsies, those with what we call biomarker positive disease, they had a very large benefit, a 10% reduction in distant metastatic disease at 15 years after treatment. But those men who had a biomarker negative disease based on that biomarker, there was absolutely no improvement um, by adding hormone therapy. And this was almost two thirds of the men on the trial. So with this, you could safely omit hormone therapy for the majority of patients today with intermediate risk disease, we give hormone therapy to. And this is just more of the fancy statistics just showing that. Now, people will often ask, well, what is in this AI model? Well, what it is, is that most of the components of that model are those digital histopathology image features, many of which 
are not necessarily human interpretable. It's extracting features and combinations of features that it's trained that it, it can identify which men benefit and do not benefit from hormone therapy. But some of our standard variables also go in the model, age, PSA, Gleason score. And so in summary, you know, hopefully I have shown you that right now today, and I think that's going to be changing very soon, nearly all treatments in the world for localized prostate cancer are driven by prognosis. The current standard of care risk stratification tools, though, are unacceptable in their performance, whether that's the D'Amico risk groups, CAPRA, NCCN, because they'll inherently over and under um, estimate a man's prognosis and thus over or under treat the man. There are improved clinical tools. We developed something called StarCap. That's probably the best model out there, but still very rarely used clinically. And there are, especially in the United States, gene expression tests that have proven to even be superior than these clinical tools. There's been a lot of challenges in global adoption because they do cost money and there's turnaround time and they're not all equal in their validation. What's very exciting is artificial intelligence, both on the histopathology and maybe MRI or imaging. This may be a more cost-effective and or scalable solution um, for men worldwide with localized prostate cancer. And so thank you so much. It's a true pleasure to speak to all of you today. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, this is my information. And thank you so much.